We're still in the PLC Professor's Workshop Lab where we develop all of our lab projects and we've been discussing sequential function charts. So with the languages in the advanced manual and right now it it looks like this. It's green and black. Uh, it's had some other covers and some older versions. It was in two pieces then it was one and now it's still one, but with a new cover, and it says uh, RS Logix 5000 Studio 5000. We're still in languages in that manual, sp specifically sequential function charts. And there are four lectures, presentations that we're doing on sequential function charts. It's really one great big thing. It, we just divided it up into four sections. You've already suffered through, I think one of them was approaching an hour and a half on analog. Uh, some of these subjects is just tough to cut it off short. So let's jump into part two of sequential function charts. Welcome back to sequential function charts. This is part two of just one portion of the languages lab discussion lecture series. If you just happen to drop into these videos at this point, you really need to go back and watch part one if you're pursuing sequential function charts. If you're just looking for anything at all pertaining to the Logix engine, then you probably need to start way back in the series. Anyway, welcome back to part two. We're going to enlarge this a little bit. Then we're going to put it in the edit mode. Remember the pencil paper? It's in the edit mode. Now we're going to go here, drop down the list, and we're going to pick L, which is time limited. Click anywhere off of it, and we've changed the time limited. However, we did not put in an element for the time or a value for the time. Uh, we can do it here, or we can go here and put in a preset. And I do believe I had you put in 2 seconds, or 2,000 milliseconds. See, this is in milliseconds. And now we're going to finalize all edits. I did also tell you to save. Technically, we're working in the controller so the program is in the controller. It is not saved offline though. Every once in a while you should save. You don't need to upload tag values. We will though, because we just put in a timer preset. We want to make sure that gets saved. No errors, no warnings. We'll get rid of that to give us some more space. We'll degeezer it so you can see the whole thing. We are in the start step, so I'm going to go to the next step. But in particular, watch the box. You see start is highlighted. You see the green highlight. Now watch a step one and the action box. You see what happened after two seconds? A step one is still active, but the action is no longer active. We've time limited it. Now in this case, it's irrelevant because once you turn on output zero, or whether you turn it on for one millisecond or for an hour, it's still on. So maybe this is not a perfect example of time limited. If we were to maybe pulse it on and off, in other words, the code in there wasn't just tag equals one, but we had cycling timers in there. Remember, this is structured text, but you could also put in a JSR and jump to another routine that has two timers in it to give you an on and off time to cycle the light on and off. If you did do that with a time limited qualifier, whatever condition the output was in when the two seconds was used up, it would stay in that state until you went back in and ran this action again. You transitioned into a step one and the action became active. Was there any other changes after that? This is a question in the manual. Yes, there was. After two seconds, the action was no longer active. 
Well, the question was, what happened at the end of the time limit? Well, the action went inactive. And after what length of time? Well, after two seconds, because that's our time limit. Now, you've seen non-stored and time-limited qualifiers. I ask you to articulate the differences. In a nutshell, non-stored executes for as long as the step is active. When the step is no longer active, it just stops executing. That would be just like a subroutine that you jumped to. When you stop jumping to that subroutine, nothing continues to execute within that subroutine. And then time-limited, it executes limited by the time base. Now let's open our online edits again. And of course we're in this step. So we will probably get the message that says, if you make these edits, it's going to jump back to that step. We'll see. I'm going to geezer this up. And now we're going to add another action. So we'll go to the step, add action. And we're going to make this one non-stored. And we'll call this, well, I didn't actually rename it, but I think I will. Go to the Properties tag, and we'll call it Stop M01, so Stop Motor 1. And how do we stop Motor 1? Well, we do this only we, so I'm going to cheat and select it, Control-C. and paste it in here, but I'm going to change this to a zero. Now, you see a problem in text run-in. Well, remember that the controller can't see the screen, so it doesn't know that we can't read it. The controller reads it perfectly fine. In order to accommodate that, I'm going to geezer down, and I'm going to move everything down a little bit. Ah, it's still a little crowded. This has nothing to do with how the program runs, only how it looks to you. Okay, we're still in the edit mode, so we're going to finalize all edits. See, we did get that message. And you'll see that when it goes back, and when it finishes, it's going to jump back to start one. No errors, no warnings. Watch very closely. I'm going to press the push button that's connected to the input module that's associated with slot 2, input data, bit 0. That toggles it in. The light went on for two seconds and then went off. Now notice that the time limited action was green for two seconds and then deactivated. The step's still active and the non-stored action is still active. Now this is just one way that you could turn on something for a length of time and then turn it back off using the actions in the sequential function chart steps. So I told you this wasn't really a language. This is where it gets a little bit of a crossover. When you start working with actions and with qualifiers, then it really starts to look more like a language. If I was going to control a motor, I certainly would not do it with these two actions. The action I would have would be to jump to a subroutine, and in the subroutine, I would just have ladder logic to turn the motor on and off. But remember, specifically in this lab project manual, we're introducing you to sequential function charts and trying to give you an orientation on what you can do with them. Not necessarily how you would do your program, only how these things function. The behavior was not as you expected. It was not as I expected the first time I used sequential function charts. A careful study of the qualifiers is needed to understand the behavior that you witnessed. I think at this point you understand these two qualifiers, time limited and non-stored. A qualifier determines when an action starts and stops. The default qualifier is N, or non-stored. The action starts when the step is activated and stops when the step is deactivated. 
If you choose a qualifier, or if you choose a timed qualifier, type the time limit or delay for the action in milliseconds. And in the manual, I showed you the timed qualifiers. There's L, time limited, S, L, stored in time limited, D, time delayed, D, S, delayed and stored, and then there's also S, D, stored in time delayed. If you just want to set a bit, use a Boolean action. In the next step of the lab, open the action, change the qualifier to non-stored, add the structure text as the action. We want to put it in the edit mode. I'll delete this one. That way the name stays. So delete element, and then I said to change this to non-stored, and then to put structured text in here. I'm going to pause while I add the structured text because this is not a lecture on structured text. All typed in. Now we're going to finalize all edits. Save and return to the run mode. We're actually still in the run mode. But just for grins, I do not want to be a bad example. I will save. And I'll upload tags. Zero errors, zero warnings. And we don't need to enlarge this to see, to see the rest of the sequential function chart. We're really only... And actually, there's nothing here to even see other than what goes active and inactive. This is non-stored. I'm going to step into step one. And we're going to start a timer when the timer enable is equal to a certain condition. So we're going to start the timer. The light stays on for two seconds and goes out. I release the button. So you see right here, our time, timer enable is equal to the state of push button associated with bit three of that input work. When I push down the push button, you can't see it, but the timer's timing. Now, there is a way you can see. You can go to view and watch. The problem is you're quite limited in screen view viewing space, so let's geezer this down and try that again. Watch. And what we want to watch is the latch delay timer We want to watch the accumulate right there. Now, if we bring this up, we can actually watch a few more things. We can also customize this. For right now, we'll just leave it as it is. Let's do that again. So I'll push that button again. You see the timers accumulating? At the end of two seconds, you can't see it, but on the hardware demo, the light goes out. If I release, recess it to zero, push the button, the timer timing light is on. I'm going to further demonstrate the non-stored qualifier. Once I start the timer and the light is on, I am going to press the Boolean expression for run step two to step this out of step one and into step two. That way we're leaving the action is actually active. It's non-stored. So it'll go inactive when we push the push button associated with bit one. So first I push to get it accumulating. Watch down below. It's accumulating. Then I push the button. Notice that it does not continue accumulating. The light is on. So we left the step and we left that timer accumulating. Just for grins, I'm going to try something. I'm going to hold down the button, push button, that's bit three. Okay? Now, it's not going to do anything because we're not executing that code, that action, Energize M01. I'm going to sequence through, back to start, and I'm going to go back into step one. Watch the accumulate down there. Oh, it reset. Okay, that's the nature of that type of action, then it's, that it's non-stored. Let's follow along exactly the way we had it in the manual. In the manual, we had you operate input zero to get it into this step. We'll step it on through 
we're back to start. I know it's hard to see. Matter of fact, let me close this down. By the way, anytime you want to watch the tags in here, you go to View and Watch. And you can drag this up, but I mean, you've got limited space. And you see a lot of tags in here. Now we can collapse Latch Delay 2. In one of the structured text, I created another tag called Accumulate, I think, and made it equal to the actual timer Accumulate. That way we could see the Accumulate without stretching out this tag. See, if we stretch that out, then we've eaten up all this space, and we don't care about any of these other tags. If I collapse that, see, here's our output zero right here that we could be watching. That's that light that we attach to the timer timing bit. But let me close this. Because theoretically, you're looking at this on the demo. You're actually, you have hardware in front of you when you do these labs. Hit zero here, and we'll go back into step one. So now we're active. It just stays there. As long as step one is active, it's a non-stored action, it just runs. So I said... Operate input 3 maintained. Held it down. The light goes on for 2 seconds and goes off. What happens when input 3 is maintained? The light goes on for 2 seconds. When the timer times out, the light goes off. Because that's what we have output 0 there. The bottom line in our structure text is equal to the timer timing bit. So when the timer timing bit goes high, the light goes on. When the timer timing bit goes low, the light goes off. Let go of input 3. Operate input 3 momentarily less than 1 second intervals. So when I do that, if I do it for less than 1 second, or in other words, I say 1 second, but anything less than the preset, the light just goes on and off when I release the button. What happens if input 3 is momentary for less than 100 milliseconds? It goes back off. The timer resets. Operate input 3 momentary in greater than 1 second intervals. Now, the reason I put one second in there is I have two seconds here, but in your lab it was one second. So, you know, I'm going to make this match, and this is a good thing to show you, editing. Now, I can't go here and double-click on this and change this. See, I can try, type in 1,000, so I actually have to, and, and this isn't, you know, this isn't a time-limited Okay, I mean that's still in there, but that's irrelevant because we're not stored now. So now let's go to the pencil paper, start edits. Now I can go in here, double click, and I'll change this to one second or 1,000 milliseconds. Finalize all edits. And this is very typical in my classrooms when I'm wrapping up labs. I go all over the place. I don't limit it to just exactly what we were doing in the lab. So I hope that didn't confuse you. Uh, but it was a good opportunity to edit your sequential function chart and change that to 1000. But notice I'm still in that step. So this is a case where the edits did not, because we're not editing the actual structure. All we are editing is the preset value. Now, there's another way I could probably do this. I could go to Program Tags. And I could go to that timer. We'll go to Monitor Tags. Latch Delay 2. There's the preset. And we'll make it 6 seconds. Oh, pop back to 1. See, it won't let you do that. Okay, so that's good to know. If this were a timer that was being used in ladder logic diagram, you could go edit it right here. You could go change the value for the preset. And I've done this before. But let me close down the tag database. It's one second. If we hold down input three for less than one second, light goes on, it goes off, on, off, on, off. But if I hold it down longer than one second, it goes off. Now, if I let go of the button and press it again, it stays on for one second and goes off. Would your conclusion be that structured text functions identically within the action as it would in a separate routine? Well, you could say yes. 
However, I'm not sure that the timer preset and your ability to edit it would be identical in structured text as it is in sequential function charts. You should go play with that. I encourage you always when you're doing these labs, especially after you're finished with the lab, and it doesn't matter how bad you mess anything up, I mean, go back and play with the stuff. If your goal is just to burn through these labs so you can say that you know how to use sequential function charts, that's not a good idea. If anything piques your curiosity while you're doing these labs, follow it. The worst you can do is have to start over. But definitely do not waste the opportunity where you, ins you were inspired. Don't waste that opportunity. Go do it. Open the editing in this sequential function chart. Create a new Boolean tag. Now I can actually go create that new Boolean tag reset push button. However, I think I'll do it all at once. The next step was open the action associated with step two and add the structured text shown below in the lab. I'm going to pause and then come back. I came back just for a second. I don't want you to have to watch me type all this in, but I am going to create a new tag. And we've not done that in the remote run online editing. So you right click new tag. It could be an integer or a double integer. We'll just leave it a double integer. Click create. Oh, it already exists. So this tag already exists because we created it in another ladder routine. But if it did not already exist, you would click create and you wouldn't get this message. So we'll cancel and I'll just do browse tag. But that's you can create new tags right in structured text and right in the sequential function charts by clicking on new tag and then creating the tag, hit create, and you've got the new tag. We'll browse ACC, there it is, hit enter, uh, typing that line. So I'm going to go space colon equals, and I want it to be equal to the accumulate value of the last delay two timer. I should have typed in LA to get to here. And then after that we want to put you have to end with a semicolon. Enter. Okay, I'm going to pause again and finish typing this in. Okay, here we are. Now we do have a little text run in here on the screen. Remember that the controller can't see that. So this is just a visual for us. However, I don't like that. Let's see if we can drag this over. That doesn't want to do that. I'm going to have to drag this down. And we're kind of running out of space vertically. Uh, our, see what our line did? So we'll geezer down here. This is one of the things that I don't particularly care for about the editor. See how the line is, and, and by the way, I'm in the remote run mode, so it really doesn't want me to mess with this line. So we're going to have to go to the program mode to straighten this out. You know, I think in the meantime, I'll just zoom back in here so we can see the code because I wanted to show you something else. So I typed this all in. Now, there's something it doesn't like here. See these red X's or these red circles with white X's? So I'm going to go verify. And you see I've got one error. So I'll go up here and I say, ooh, we click on that. Right there, reset push button. Now, in the lab, I had you create that tag. And then this wouldn't have popped up. See, now it's red, which means it's happy. So now we'll... Verify, I see zero errors. Oh, three warnings, that's no problem. We're using the same tags in many places. So I just wanted to show you that. I'm going to go back and clean up this mess and not make you watch. I did not actually leave the remote run mode. All I did was geezer down. And I deleted, this is in the edit mode. So remember, when you're editing code 
it's not changing the code that's running. It's editing a mirror image of it. And then when you finalize all edits, it takes the changes and reassembles them into the code. I deleted this line and then reconnected it. And now it's more palatable. And we don't have our text run-ins that we had before. So we'll finalize all edits. In the lab, what I had to do was compare that structured text. Remember, this is not a lab on structured text. Text. It's on sequential function charts. But I had you compare that code to some ladder logic. We'll go down to step one. See now it's active. And I can do the business with a light going on and off or staying on. Now I'll go down to the next step. Now we get a whole different behavior. And I'm going to geezer up so I can read it, so you can read it. And it says, if start push button, of course, what is start push button? We don't know, because you can't display the alias information in here in structured text. For the folks that like structured text, you know, if you're going to write a piece of code and never have to troubleshoot it, never really have to edit it to speak of on the fly, now structured text is fine. Of course, you would never do this kind of code in structured text. We only did it for the sake of you know, the point we're making here, or the fact we're doing sequential function charts. That's why we have structured text in there, but it could be a JSR, and it's jumping to a subroutine that's ladder logic that's doing this exact same thing. So if you look at this code, we set up a timer, we define a timer, and we say if start push button, then the timer enable for that timer equals one. So if you push the start push button, when we mouse over, there it is, input zero. So that's how you're going to have to do this. I'm going to push input zero. Remember that input zero is also used back up the way here to go from start to step one, but it shouldn't matter in this case. This should start the timer. However, in order to see the LED, the start LED, we need the timer to be enabled. See, so if we push the start button, then the timer enable equals one. And if the timer enable is one and we have the display switch, which is, come on, mouse over, the next push button, then, and so I'll just flip that on so it's maintained and push zero. Okay, both lights come on. The start and the timer timing. The timer timing light is going to go out after five seconds, and then the done bit comes on, turns on the latched light. I let go of the button and output three, which is this one right here, latched LED. That's the third output. Output 0, output 1, output 2. So output 2 is on right now. Now if we were to push the reset button, which the reset button, oh you know I made that a boolean tag but I did not make it associated with, I didn't alias it to an input. We could go to, we'll try this, we'll go to watch and we'll go down to reset push button. and the light went off. So I turned on the reset push button and the light went off. Now I'm going to go fix this. Now you didn't do this in lab, okay? So I hope this isn't confusing you, but when you're writing code, this is exactly what's going to go on. Okay? We knew that the I knew that the reset push button had to be associated, had to be alias to an actual input. I just forgot to do it. And this is typical of the kind of stuff that you're going to do when you're writing code. If you think you're going to write a bunch of code and then commission it and not have to fix mistakes, I don't know what you're smoking or taking, but <laughs> it's just not going to happen. Only one time in my whole career did I do something, and it was fairly convoluted, and it worked absolutely perfect. I did not have to fix anything, and it scared the bejesus out of me. That's the only time ever, and it was a... 15 node device net network using RS networks for device net and each node had a whole bunch of IO in it. I went through, I configured it, I downloaded it, I put it in run, I enabled the scanner card and 
wouldn't you know it everything worked perfect so let's go back to the edit mode here I'm gonna pause okay I put it in the edit mode as you can see up here we're in the edit mode I'm gonna to go to reset push button and I'm going to double click on this window to open it up then I'm going to right click and reset push button go to edit reset push button properties it's not gonna let me do this online in the run mode once I set it to a base, so literally to fix this, this is just normal for RSLogix 5000. Once you've created the tag, it puts it in memory where it wants to put it. And there may not be space around it in memory to edit it, to change the shape. And we're going to change the actual shape of this tag because we're going to alias it to an actual I.O. So I'm going to say cancel. I'm going to cancel the edits. I'm going to save. I'm not going to upload tag. Well, yeah, we'll upload tag values. That way we know for sure we got our timer presets, etc. When the swirly's gone, now we're going to go offline. And now I'm going to go to program tags. I'm going to go to reset. We want edit, by the way. So I'll go to reset, push button, and it is aliased for two. Oh, there it is. I created a new one, reset underscore push button. This is all typical of what you run into in the field. Now, they're both called reset push button. I created one called reset underscore push button, which is probably what I had you do in the lab, whereas... In the ladder logic, the reset push button was R-E-S-E-T-P-B, no underscore. So we can go back and either change this tag in the logic to be this tag, which is really what we should do. Now, as long as I've got you out here, if I wanted to go in here and alias it for the same local input, I think it's bit 2. Okay, see now they're identical. They're both bit two. Now we can go, we could download, go online, but instead what I'm going to do is I'm just going to go back online and I'm going to change the structured text to use reset push button without the underscore. It's always debatable whether or not to leave this type of machinations in the video recording or not. Some people want to see, we'll upload. In other words, what's offline doesn't match what's online. So we'll upload. We want what's in the controller. Anyway, I was saying a lot of people don't want to see these machinations. They just want to go bang, 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 and out. In class, you would be seeing all this. So I'll pause it while it's uploaded. We paused while it was downloading, or rather uploading, to make sure that the offline matched the online. So now we're going to go to the edit mode. I'm going to simply open up this routine, delete the underscore, and now it's associated with the tag that we wanted it associated with. Finalize all edits. If you don't re recognize this code, this was the structured text code that we used to match the function block diagram to match the ladder logic diagram that we started with in the beginning. Zero errors, zero warnings. And so now we'll execute that again. Are still in step zero because we really didn't change the code. We just changed the tag. So if I push input zero, the timer timing and the enable light go on, the start light. And after five seconds, the blue light goes on. And if I push the push button associated with bit two, it resets. So the code works good. That's what you should have found when you did this in your lab project. And I also had you then, of course, compare to Ladder Logic 2. Yep, I had you compare it to that one. And I think I had you compare it to either this one or Ladder Logic 3. Right. So I had you compare it to these two to see if there was any logical difference and, and there should not have been any. So I did ask you that in the lab manual. Do you perceive any logical differences between the three? We don't need these 
open anymore, so we'll close them. I'm right clicking and then picking close routine. We also had the main routine open just so we could do our program control. So you see that we have sequential function chart 01 enabled. We'll go back to this one and then we'll geezer down so you can see the whole thing. Now in the manual it says finalize all edits, save and go online to the go online to the remote run mode and test your code. We just tested it. Now you can't see it because we would have to do a fairly complicated custom watch panel. It's this panel right here under view watch. And really the only thing you can see in the sequential function chart itself is what is active. You can't see any values. You have to go to the watch and you can create a custom. And a quick watch, you can do a quick watch. And this is what I call the custom. Here we could put in the tags that we want to watch specifically. This is like a custom data monitor from 5 and 500. The easiest way to program an action is to write the logic as structured text within the body of the action. When the action turns on, the controller executes the structured text. Use a JSR instruction to execute a subroutine when the action is active. So you can either put in structured text or you can JSR out to any of the other two, function block diagrams as well as ladder logic. We want to do some more with the qualifiers. So far we've, we've used N for non-stored and we did a little with L for time limited. So we're going to leave this program as is. Uh, we may come back, come back and butcher this one up for another part of the lab, but in the meantime, I in your lab book, I said save your project, go offline. If you want to save your current sequential function chart, then create a new SFC routine, FSC underscore zero two, and add this sequential function chart that was shown in the lab book. Now, there's another way to do that. You can't do this online program or otherwise mode. I'm going to go offline. Now, technically, I would save, although I just did this, you know, to make this complete. Save, then I'm going to go offline. Once I'm offline, then I can take, click inside, anywhere inside this window and do a Control A, Control C, then go to SFC underscore zero two, open it up. Delete that because I don't want that in there. And then do a control V for paste. See, it's all in there. So now I have all of that code in there from sequential function chart underscore zero one. So I'm going to delete this step. And the naturally the line then doesn't go anywhere, so I'll delete that wire as well. Then I'll throw it back in. And we're going to edit this step. One thing that you run into when you do a lot of copy and paste is it tends to create new tags automatically for you for the steps and for the transitions. In the manual, it shows start, transition 10, and transition 2. Those just arbitrarily popped up. You can name those anything you want. We're not really concerned at this point about how you name the transition or the steps. If what you see on the screen here does not match what you did in the book as far as the name of the transitions and the steps, don't worry about it. Just worry about the actual functionality. Also, we reminded you that in the main routine, you may have to put in some code to allow you, and we'll geezer this down. So, you can, so it's not wrapped. So we're going to toggle this one off. That way when we download SFC2, so we'll toggle that one on. Of course, nothing happens. You're offline, right? But when you download, it downloads the database. So it'll be executing sequential function chart underscore zero two. This is already designated as the initial step. At least it should be. See, initial step. So we're good there. And notice instead of start, it's start 001. It was start when we copied it. And this was step, I think, 01, and it put the extra zero in there. So you can rename these if you want. If you want them to match, 
then rename them so it looks the same. But remember that this really doesn't matter. But the action does. So in the action, we're going to do an if then, else, and an end if. We want it non stored, so I am going to, and I'll start over just like you did in your lab. So I'm going to put in if space, and I can do a browse tag or I could just type it in, but we'll do a browse and we'll go to local 2i data 1. So if local 2i data 1, then space, we want to browse for another tag. And we want local again and see we have to stretch this over ourselves, otherwise we can't see it. Then local one output data zero. So far we have if this is on, then turn on that. Okay. We'll stretch this out a little bit more so we got more room to play with here. Now we didn't finish this expression. It says then local slot one output data bit zero but we we have to say then what we want to turn on turn it on for what space colon equal one semicolon enter else or you could say otherwise but else is the actual code and we want to grab this same one right here Control C, come down here, Control V, and change this to zero. We've already got the semicolon, so space E N D underscore I F and if semicolon. Now you don't have to have all those spaces in there, but I like it to be readable. Okay, now we've got the transition here. The condition is input zero. We're using input one here. We don't also want to use it here. Now we could do that, okay? But it's not going to work out well for you because as soon as you push the button, execute this, it's going to transition out. Excuse me, transition out. So go down here and we'll just change this to bit two. Now we're ready to save, download, and return to the remote run mode. So we save it. We could save it with a new name, but we won't. And now communications, who active, pick your processor and download. I'm going to pause and not make you watch all this. I came back just for a few moments to show you something that won't happen to you when you're doing the lab, but could very easily happen to you in the field. So I'm downloading this and it comes up and says one error. So I look in here and I I see nothing but happy sequential function charts. I just didn't look far enough down. So I went up here until I found the error. I clicked on it and it pops up and here way down on the sequential function chart I've got some carnage down there. I have a remnant that I did not delete. So it's highlighted. I'll delete it. Now I'll verify and voila. Zero errors, zero warnings. Now I'm going to continue the download and pause while I'm doing it. Download it back online with our nice, simple little program. Uh, this is not a whole lot different than the very first one we did, other than our action. Even though it's not stored, we have a else and if. And of course, this is structured text. So if I transition into step one, by pressing the push button associated with bit zero. We'll call that N1. <clears throat> Typically in the labs, I refer to inputs and outputs as N0, N1, etc., out zero, out one, etc. So we transition into step one and the light is on. And I used input one and why isn't it working? Well, I know immediately why it's not working. And I thought that I change that so it did step into step one from start one if this then turn on that bit and now i'm going to push input one push button and the light goes on and off with the push button 
So as long as that action, as, as long as step one is active and the action is therefore active because it's non-stored, as I toggle input one on and off, the light goes on and off with it. And I did show you the equivalent ladder logic diagram for that structured text, which is a true of on addressing local 2i data 1, energized output local 1, output data 0. Notice that we have sequenced the inputs for simpler execution. In other words, I have input 0, input 1, input 2, and we're going to kind of follow that pattern from now on just to make it simpler to exercise. Input 0 transitions into step 1 which stays active until you press the push button associated with input 2. As long as step 1 is active, you can work within that code. In other words, the code is functioning. In the run mode, press and release input 1 repeatedly for different lengths of time. What is the behavior? Now, as long as the button is held down, the light stays on. With input 1 off, press input 2. So, Input 1 is off, I press input 2, and that transitions back to the start. Now, we don't have a sequence of steps here. We have a start, a step, and then it transitions online. No, you can't. You can't drag the position. I was going to shorten this up so I can make it bigger, easier to see. Well, next time we're editing, I'll move that transition up to so I can enlarge this on the screen. With input 1 off, pressing input 2, what happened? Well, it transitioned out of step 1 and back up to start 1. All switches off, press and release input 0. Step 1 should be active again. Press and maintain input 1 and then press and release input 2 followed by releasing input 1. So in other words, what we're going to do is I'm going to push down input 1. The light comes on. Then I'm going to press input 2. It sequences out. I let go of the button. And we're no longer active step one in its action, but the light is still on. Because when I transitioned out of step one back to the start step, the light was on. So this logic here never executed the else. In other words, this was true or on the last time this got scanned. And then when we push this button, it cycled back to start. It stopped executing this structured text and left it in the state it was in. What common situation with ladder logic diagrams would you relate this behavior to? Well, if you have a JSR to a subroutine, and in that subroutine, you are turning things on or off and on off, and you stop jumping to that subroutine, meaning you have a condition or a permissive in the wrong, in the main routine, that jumps to that routine. If you stop jumping to that routine, it's going to leave all of the data controlled by that routine exactly in the state it was in when you left. Now, one of the following two choices. Okay, we're going to change something. You can copy SFC2 and paste it into the main program and add a routine control in the main routine, or edit your existing SFC to, to match the following by changing the qualifier from N to S. So I'm going to put this in the edit mode. Then I'm going to change this to S, stored. That's the only change we need to make. I'm also going to move this up a little bit. That will allow us to geezer up some, much more palatable to the eyeball. We're going to finalize all edits. So although we did not stored and time limited before, we're going to do a little bit more. We're going to emphasize the actual qualifiers and not the sequential function chart. Zero errors, zero warnings. That's a good thing. Now this is stored. Follow these directions very carefully or you will have to put the controller into the program mode and back to the run and start over. So the first time that this code runs, coming out of the program mode, it has, well, the light's turned on right now. In other words, remember when we left this, we left the light on. In order to get it to do what I want you to do, I'm going to have to go to the program mode. And of course, the light goes out because outputs are turned off in the program mode. I'm going to go back to the run mode, and the light stays off. 
So right now the light is off. I'm going to go into step one. And when I push input one, you know, repeatedly, does output zero toggle on and off with it? Yes, it does. Why? Because the step is active. The, the step is active. The action is active. And it's executing right now. And as I push the button, if input one, then local output zero equals one. Else, it equals zero. So that, that code is all functioning. Press and release input zero to transition into step one, out of step one. Okay, press and release input zero to transition out of step one. This is going to take you back to start. We're in start step. Okay, and I said to toggle when the start step is active, as seen above, toggle input one on and off repeatedly and watch output zero. Does output zero toggle on and off with it? No, it doesn't. The reason that I toggled the mode of the controller to program it back is because I wanted output zero to be off. Now I could have just cycled through when it was off and accomplished the same thing. But I want to demonstrate something here. If you have a state that exists that you don't want any longer but you don't want to cycle back through, you can go to program mode and then back to run and it'll drop it out. In the lab I said, press and release input one multiple times. What does the light do? Does output zero toggle on and off with it? No, it doesn't. Why? Because even though it's a stored qualifier on that action, it's not been executed yet. So it's not active. Now press and release input zero to transition into step one. Press and release input one multiple times while step one is active. What happens? Light goes on and off with every toggle of input one. Repeat the earlier sequence of maintaining input one while you press and release input two. So I'm going to hold down input one, the light's on, I'm going to push input two, and you see that we're back to the start. Then release input one. Do you see a different result? Of course you do. If so, what was the difference? Well, when you cycled out of step one, in other words, you satisfy the condition for the second transition and went back to the start step, notice that the action in step one is still green. It's still active because it's stored. So you activated it, it's stored. It stores the activation and it continues to run. So you can push in one all you want right now and it goes. the light goes on and off with it. That's the difference. When it was non-stored, then the code was not being executed unless that step was active. It was stored once you activate the step, it's activated. Now you can reset it with a reset instruction, and we'll look at that probably very late in this lab. If you're not sure that you sequence this procedure correctly, toggle the F, the sequential function chart until the start step is active, switch to the program mode to stop execution, then back to the run mode and repeat the steps. You may even have to change the qualifier back to non-stored Repeat the earlier sequence so you can be reminded of how the non-stored behave. Then change the qualifier to stored. And once again, do not rush through these labs without getting the expected results. That is the difference between the non-stored and the stored qualifier. So we've really covered those now. Let's take another break. This is the end of part two. We're not finished yet. We have roughly another hour to go. So there will be a part three, unlikely a part four. Thank you for watching. Look for part three.